and uh, welcome on behalf of all the trustees and staff. How many here are really here for the first time? Wow, awesome. it's amazing. You know, we've been able to attract new people here all the time, and it's, it's such an honor and pleasure to do that. It's really been an exciting 24 hours. You know, last evening, we proudly inducted Morris Chang as a museum fellow, along with John Hennessy, Dave Patterson, and Chuck Thacker. It was a great, great event. Morris, congratulations. And tonight, we're very fortunate to have him here at the museum once again in an engaging conversation with his good friend, Jensen Huang, a pioneer himself in our industry, whom I'll introduce in a moment. And we thank Morris and his wife, Sophie, for coming all the way from Taiwan for these special two days here at the Computer History Museum. The museum's mission is to preserve and present for posterity the artifacts and stories of the information age. You know, it's often, it's often very hard to visualize the impacts of things that happened in the past. If you put yourself backwards, we're always thinking to the future. <clears throat> Try to imagine, just for a moment, if you lived in a community and the only way to get food was to pay some huge sum of money to a supermarket or to grow it yourself, except that to grow it yourself, you had to mortgage your house to buy the equipment to make it happen. You know, food all of a sudden becomes literally impossible to get, have access to. And you could only obtain it even if you needed it. Well, if you go back to the 70s and 80s, when semiconductors were really far too costly for small companies or academics to use, I realized this when I worked at DARPA, because we pioneered a program, a prototype service to dramatically reduce costs called MOSIS and give access to people like John Hennessy and David Patterson. Now, just think of what it would be like to build a commercial international enterprise like TSMC has done that to today allows innovation in microelectronics to abound from startups to mature companies. That's what Morris really has helped achieve at TSMC and much, much more, which you'll hear about tonight. The Computer Museum is collecting and exhibiting these stories and sponsors great programs. And tonight I'd like to feature a special thing that we have done in semiconductors and the systems that they have enabled. We have a special group called the Semiconductor Special Interest Group that's been in operation now for the last two years, doing oral histories, helping us collect, creating a website for enthusiasts like, enthusiasts, I should say, like everyone in this room. It's www.computerhistory.org. And overall, our museum is putting together a new timeline exhibit in our, in our next phase. It will open in 2009, and we'll have a semiconductor component that will tell the whole story of computing history. We're designing online exhibits that will probably, we hope, will take your breath away in the next few years, and kicking off our education program. In fact, our education director, whom we just hired, um, will be getting next Monday. So look forward to all things to come, and I hope those of you that have raised your hand this evening has been the first time, won't have to raise your hand the next time. Uh, we hope you will also become a member, a donor, a corporate sponsor, or volunteer. And we are also completing our major funding campaign, and we invite you all to participate. Just ask one of our staff members or anyone around here this evening or any time for more information. We have also joined hand, hands with SEMI, SIA, and many volunteers to help us authentically represent the contributions that semiconductors and the systems of all the systems that they enabled, which virtually is the reason why we as a computer history museum are so interested in this. I hope you will visit us often and take advantage of our weekly docent led tours and visible storage. We're open on Wednesday, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays from roughly 1 to 5 p.m. each day. And a couple of administrative notes. Um, I noticed you noticed in as you sat down there's a, there's a, there's a uh, actually a semiconductor um, questionnaire that's in your seat. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and this lecture this evening is the second <clears throat> of three of the pioneering lectures that, we've, we've, that they have sponsored for us. 
and from a grant that we have. So we ask you that you fill out that survey uh, that are on your chairs because they're going to be used to help us evaluate the program and to improve it over in the future. Um, and if you do, by the way, and you give us your email address, you have the opportunity to win a new coffee table publication called Core Memory uh, by the noted Bay Area photographer Mark Richards. So we greatly appreciate your feedback. And the last administrative thing is, is please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already, or your trios, or whatever machine that you may have on you, or your computing. Now it's my pleasure and honor to really uh, talk a little bit about Jensen Huang and NVIDIA. At last night's event, NVIDIA Corporation was our headline sponsor of the 2007 Fellows Award. A sold out crowd of 570 people. We thank NVIDIA again for their generosity and we're pleased to see so many of you from last evening here in the audience tonight. Thank you very much. Jensen is co-founder, CEO, and president of NVIDIA, who is also a very close friend of Dr. Chang, personally and professionally, and you'll see that this evening. He was born in Taipei, Taiwan. He spent several years living in Thailand until he was accidentally sent to a Christian boarding school in Kentucky. He went on to move to Oregon with his parents, and, and from there, he received his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Oregon State University in 1984 and his master's degree in electrical engineering from Stanford. While at Oregon State, he met his future wife, Lori, who was with us this evening, his engineering lab partner at the time. So technology does help spur some of these relationships, I think. And they have two wonderful children who I think are with us tonight as well. And prior to founding NVIDIA, Jensen was director of Coreware at LSI Logic and a microprocessor designer at Advanced Micro Devices in Sunnyvale. The museum would again like to thank Jensen and NVIDIA and all those people here in attendance for taking a leadership role early as a champion for the Computer History Museum and more specifically for the Fellows event last night. It tells the stories of the people, a very important part of our whole enterprise here at the museum. They are outstanding leaders, Morris and Jensen together, and individually, and have changed our industry in many different ways. And the Computer Museum is really fortunate to have their time and their friendship. It is now my very great pleasure to introduce one of tonight's two speakers, Jensen Huang, who will introduce Dr. Chang. Jensen, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, you know, when, when uh, Morris asked me to um, uh, be the person to, to interview him, uh, I was thinking about the format and uh, the nature of our, of our conversation. And I thought that it would be, would be particularly special if we just turn it into a conversation. I've had, over the, um, uh, over the last 10 years, I have had many uh, conversations with Morris and all of them are insightful and, and valuable to me. And, and I thought that it would be uh, quite remarkable for all of us uh, to, uh, to be able to talk to Morris um, as if, if uh, it's just one of the conversations I've had with Morris over the years. Um, you know, we've, um, through the course of, of the last several years, uh, and also certainly last night, uh, have learned a lot about Morris's history. And... Um, uh, his childhood and, and his uh, journey uh, in his career. I thought that what we should do tonight uh, is, is to spend the time talking about his uh, taking, taking the story past his life, but be now focused on the, uh, the work of his life. And so, so uh, to frame it, let me first, uh, in, instead of introducing Morris, I'm going to in, introduce his work. Uh, and you know, notice, notice how quickly uh, when John told my life story, uh, and, and he was, he was um, comprehensive. Notice how short and concise it was. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think he left out any details. <laughs> there's, there's nothing left. Um, and so, so uh, to, to describe Morris's life work uh, is um, an extraordinary endeavor, but, but let, me, uh, first, let me just read a few things to you guys uh, just to frame uh, Morris's life work. 
Uh, Morris, of course, as we know, is, uh, is uh, recognized uh, in, around the world as the father of the dedicated semiconductor founder. He founded TSMC in 1987 at the young age of 55. Uh, he created the world's first pure play foundry uh, with $220 million of investment from the Taiwanese government uh, and Philips. Uh, he uh, spun uh, TSMC out of Itri and formed TSMC. Ten years later, he took the company public, took it public on the New York Stock Exchange in 1997 with a market cap of $6 billion. Okay, now just $220 million in 1987, $6 billion in 1997. Now he grew the, the company 43% compounded annual growth rate uh, over the course of that 20 years till today, and today TSMC has revenues of about $10 billion, a market cap of nearly $60 billion, the second most valuable semiconductor company in the world, with the ex second to only Intel, and um, the most valuable company in Taiwan, the most valuable company in all of Taiwan. Uh, and that, that really only begins to, to, um, uh, to describe uh, the impact or the value or the strategic importance that TSMC really serves. TSMC has also enabled what's more, far, far more important and, and what he was recognized for yesterday, uh, enabled an industry of $50 billion large on top of it. Uh, Morris describes TSMC as having created a sub-industry, uh, a sub-industry enabling uh, an industry called the fabulous semiconductor industry which today has revenues of $50 billion. So if you think about the overall value that has been created as a result of the founding of TSMC in the last 20 years, and if we simply use the multiple, say 4X multiple, for that $50 billion worth of semiconductor companies of which, t which uh, NVIDIA is part of, uh, $250 billion of shareholder value was created in the last 20 years, $250 billion. Um, the evidence of a great company, of course, is not just in um, uh, the creation, certainly, of, of strategic importance uh, and also wealth, but also uh, indication of greatness is the ability for the company to continue to flourish and be successful as the founder and the original, found, the, the original uh, president passes on the leadership to the next generation. In 2005, uh, Morris uh, passed on, passed the uh, CEO and president uh, responsibilities to Rick Sy, who's doing a fabulous job, and um, TSMC has continued to grow. And if all of that is not enough, Morris is a world-class bridge player. And uh, you know, I think it was in one of our one of our conversations. I noted that that um, that uh, uh, Warren Buffett and and um, Bill Gates were also uh, bridge players, and uh, and Morris um, expressed some interest to play them, and and in fact, uh, quite a bit of confidence that he would he would prevail. Um, <clears throat> And so, so uh, that, that uh, in a nutshell, is TSMC. Uh, unbelievable uh, body of work uh, and um, uh, unbelievable uh, impact on the world. And so tonight, Morris, I thought what we would do is we would talk about um, how did you do it? <laughs> and so with that, I have no other questions. <laughs> first, first, first of all, welcome. <laughs> So, so uh, let me let me ask let me let me frame let me break it down a, a bit. So, so you know, Morris, both of us, we were founders of of, uh, of our companies, and um, uh, and we we uh, we think about building products, but but not only that, we think about building companies. And in the in the process of building companies, uh, we go through several phases. As I think through the history of Nvidia, of which you were involved in many of the phases of of uh, my company. Uh, you know, as you think through TSMC, what were the phases, distinct phases that you could remember, uh, and how do you think through them? Yeah, the first phase, of course, was uh, just uh, survival phase. You know, they 
we started a company uh, with uh, uh, a lot of money, $220 million uh, uh, back in 1985, 86, was considered to be a, a lot of money. Well, it's a lot of money even now, I think. And particularly in Taiwan. In Taiwan, it was very difficult uh, to raise that much money. Uh, as uh, Jensen said, uh, uh, the government uh, funded uh, about half of it, 48% actually, of the 220 million. And uh, Phillips pitched in with uh, another 27%. And the rest, about uh, 25%, was uh, from uh, a dozen. Taiwan investors. But uh, anyway, $220 million uh, total was uh, a lot of money, and uh, uh, I was uh, really, um, the first priority was uh, to protect uh, that money, you know, shouldn't uh, all be, uh, uh, should all go to a drain. I, I, can't, I can't afford to lose money. Um, uh, so the first phase was uh, survival, uh, but uh, I had a lot of experience, operating experience, uh, before founding uh, TSMC. So uh, I had decided uh, what the values of the of the company should be, and th those uh, values, uh, I think, were very important to us. Uh, 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 not only in the first phase, but uh, uh, from there on, uh, and we we have we have. Uh, uh, maintained them. Uh, we have uh, uh, actually followed them. They, they, they are our compass, really. But the values are pretty simple. Uh, at first, there were just uh, three. Integrity was uh, number one. Commitment. We, we really wanted uh, employees to be totally committed to TSMC. But uh, 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 in return, the company is committed to the employees too. And uh, also, commitment applies to customers. We want the customers to be committed to TSMC, but we in return are totally committed to customers. So, so that's uh, integrity is uh, pretty, pretty simple, self-explanatory. Commitment works uh, between employees and the company and between customers and the company. And then the third one uh, is innovation. We, we, we knew that uh, we couldn't uh, compete at all without uh, uh, constantly uh, innovating. Uh, so those were our three values. Uh, and then we, we, we also had a vision. Uh, the vision uh, uh, changed. Values don't change. The, the three values that we had at the beginning are still values today. And in fact, the first time I went to visit you in Taiwan, instead of, uh, instead of a, a presentation about all the capabilities of TSMC, uh, I you gave you, me a brochure of the core values of TSMC. That's right. That's right. And I do the same thing uh, with a lot of visitors, uh, uh, with every customer every potential customer. Uh, and uh, uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, uh, we, we, as you pointed out, uh, we, we have been the most uh, valuable company in Taiwan. So we have attracted a lot of public attention too. Political candidates uh, usually, before they started the campaigning, would uh, call on me. So the president, the presidential candidate came and uh, he told me all his um, big vision about uh, Taiwan, and I handed him our values, integrity, <laughs> commitment, and innovation. <laughs> yeah, presidential candidacy from both parties. So, you know, and uh, uh, in fact, I, I thought that I detected that in each of them uh, a little Surprise, you know, I mean, they got this, they don't know what to do with it. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, look, uh, every company, you know, goes through uh, phases. Uh, first is the survival phase, and then there is 
the rapid growth phase. Uh, and now, when did you guys get traction? When did you guys get business traction and you started to feel like, you know what, somebody's going to buy this? Well, that, uh, that didn't happen uh, because we, I guess we were too expensive, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, even from the, even at the beginning, well, at the beginning, of course, nobody... Nothing's even, changed. Huh? <laughs> I'm just... <yeah. laughs> nobody even wanted to... You walked to, into that, Morris. You walked right into that. Yeah. I didn't do, I, I didn't push you, you walked right into it. Nobody even wanted to invest in us. Uh, we were really considered to be uh, not very uh, hopeful. Um, uh, and that, that that was the first uh, two or three years, I think. Uh, at least, uh, I would say from 87, we started uh, in February of 87. And uh, 87, 88, 89, 90, uh, I would say four years. Four years were... Uh, it was touch and go, you know. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, but um, what really uh, started, uh, what really gave us a, a, a big start was this, uh, this uh, rapid emergence of the fabulous industry, companies like yours. Uh, of course, you, yours uh, came up. Uh, I'm practically the last NVIDIA. established company. M NVIDIA, yeah. NVIDIA, of course, uh, rose uh, pretty late uh, in the game. Uh, uh, you, you rose in the middle 90s. Uh, but uh, there were several uh, uh, that uh, started to uh, rise in the early 90s. And uh, so those fabulous companies really accelerated the, our growth. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, mm -hmm. we helped them. Actually, they wouldn't even have uh, started uh, uh, if we weren't around, mm -hmm. if we hadn't been around. They because knew. In fact, in fact the, um, when NVIDIA started in 1993, uh, there, there, was, there was no available foundry in the world. No. In well, fact, we, we were there, but uh, you, you didn't you didn't consider us to I be... I did consider you. You just didn't call me back. <laughs> yeah, we we now weren't... Let, let, it, let it go on record that I, I, I tried to call Morris. I just didn't get, get a phone call back. I... <laughs> really? In 93? <I>, no. <laughs> I, called, I called somebody in the local office. I don't, I don't want to throw anybody under the bridge here, but, but um, I didn't get a call back. I, I just... Maybe I called the wrong number, but... <laughs> but in 96 was different, right? Oh, 96, you, yeah, 96 was completely different. And don't, don't try to change the topic, but... Uh, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> my rec... <laughs> my, so, by, 19, by 1996, 97, TSMC was about a billion dollars already. Yes. Right? And you, you, um, you, you clearly... Uh, I would guess, in looking at the market cap, uh, it, it would probably... You were probably a $1.5 billion company when you took the company public. A, well, actually, when we went the uh, IPO in Taiwan, which was 94, we had uh, a market cap of $4 billion. And uh, then uh, you pointed out that uh, in 97, when we went public in New York, we had a market cap of about $6 billion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, now, at but, the time, in 1997, when you and I met, NVIDIA was uh, completed that year with $27 million in revenues. And yeah, we had we right. had a hundred people, yeah. um, and then we we met, and it is it is you guys probably don't don't believe this, but Morris used to make sales calls, you used to make house calls, right? And we you would come yeah. and, and visit customers, and I would explain to yes. Morris uh, what it is that that Nvidia did, and and um, I, and and you know I I would explain how big our die size needed to be, and that every year was going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and. And um, uh, and you you would come back to Nvidia periodically to to uh, make me tell the story over again just to just to make sure that I'm going to need that many wafers. And and next year uh, we started working with uh, TSMC. Nvidia did uh, I think it was 127. Yeah. And then from mm -hmm. that point forward, we grew uh, nearly 100 percent per year until yeah. now. I mean uh, our compounded annual growth rate over the last. Uh, Ten years was 70, 70 some odd percent. Yeah. And so, uh, not once, not once. Um, okay, maybe five times did did, uh, yeah. did capacity get in the way of my growth. 
um, <clears throat> four times last week. But <laughs> honestly, but you know, um, <laughs> you know all through all through the nineties, uh, all through the nineties, uh, and even now, even now, in, in the, just really the biggest joy I get out of uh, this job, uh, CEO or chairman of uh, of TSMC, the biggest pleasure I got out of it was to see my customers grow and uh, make money and succeed. You know, I, I really, I, I, I believe that. And, and I uh, honestly uh, feel that when every time we get together. You know, I, I could tell that you, you, um, you feel so strongly about your customers. This is a story that, that I'm sure he doesn't appreciate me telling, but, but um, this, is, this is, must have been six, seven years ago. And, and uh, it was on a Friday afternoon. And um, uh, you, you called and you, you asked if you could drop by to see me. And, and, and so I thought, okay, well, yeah, sure. Uh, you could drop by any time. And I was expecting, you know, your, the, all of the TSMC sales, sales guys that, that I usually see and Panway and Ron Norris and all those guys to show up. And, and no, you were just all, you were all by yourself on a Friday afternoon. And, and you just wanted to talk about business and see how things were going and, and, um, uh, and how many wafers you needed, and and <clears throat> and you would always write that, that write that down in that, that black book, and it would always make me nervous. And I would check my check my CEO math, and and um, and make sure that I gave Still you the right here. number. <laughs> <laughs> so you 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 would write it all down, and and um, and and mm. more. You know, credit where credit. Credit is due. I, I was right 100 percent of the time, uh, and 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 um, it turns out uh, I found out several years later it was his honeymoon. Yep, yep. That I, Sophie, I don't know what what it says that he wanted to see me more. <laughs> well, we've we've always been close, Morris, and, and so. <laughs> But that's that's he honestly he honestly loved loved um, loved working with his customers and so let's come back to to uh, so in the starting about ninety four ninety five time frame clearly TSMC gained traction and and it was about that time that that other companies started to notice TSMC's growth and the foundry other foundries were starting to emerge competition yes right yeah. competition were starting mm -hmm. to emerge yeah. mm -hmm. and one of their one of the strategies that I recall. Because you were you were you were completely pure play, mm -hmm. and uh, and um, Toshiba or or Fujitsu or the Jap many Japanese yeah. companies mm -hmm. would also do some foundry. Mm -hmm. uh, even HP, I think, did some foundry with their yeah. excess capacity. Yeah, I did foundry. Intel did foundry with their excess capacity. Yeah, so they were, excess, yeah. one strategy was to use excess capacity um, as a as a foundry play, and then and then another company emerged that some competitors emerged where. They used JVs as a strategy, where they would go out to the customers and they would form JVs uh, with the customer base. And um, how, how did you, you know, how did you respond to that? What was the dynamic in the industry at the time? And here, here, all of a sudden, you're competing with your customers in a way because they were also in the foundry business. They had they had JVs and foundries. Yeah. Well, uh, I never thought that uh, the JV strategy uh, was. Uh, a good one for either us or our customers. I mean, I think that your example uh, demonstrates that uh, very uh, clearly. Um, the the JV concept was uh, that um, a partner or several partners would uh, co-invest in a fab. Of course, the uh, foundry. Uh, company uh, is the main investor, but several customers would uh, also invest in, in the fab. And uh, each customer would have maybe a 15, 20 percent share of the, uh, of the fab. And um, uh, then theoretically, uh, this customer who has uh, invested in 15, 20 percent uh, will enjoy uh, 15, 20 percent of the capacity of the fab, but look at uh, your your case. You went from almost nothing to um, 
you mean you, you, you multiplied, the, you grew about what, 10 times in one year, something like that? Well, we, we went from five or six 20, times anyway. 27 million to today, you know, $5 well, billion. Dollars no, I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about just one year. About five times a year, yeah. Five, five times, times yeah. five times a year. So uh, if he had invested in 20% uh, 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 of, a, of a fab, if NVIDIA had invested in 20% and get only 20% of the fab's capacity, and then um, in, 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 in a few months, you know, you, you have outgrown the capacity you, 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 you are supposed to, to get. Then what will happen, you know? Well, I would be a, I would be a, I would be a, a peaceful, peaceful CEO running a, a $37 million company today. I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, they, you, do, you, don't have to be, you don't have to be limited to that, but, but I think it's far better for a foundry company, for TSMC, to stay very flexible. We, we actually, back then, we were plowing all the money, all the profit, uh, back into uh, capacity uh, building uh, uh, capital expenditures. So, so we were building, our, we're increasing our capacity very, very significantly every year. And uh, we, we were extremely flexible to, to all the customers. Some customers, frankly, shrank. Uh, and uh, some customers, like you, grew rapidly. And uh, we, we just Managed the. I mean, I, it was difficult, and uh, even now, looking back, uh, I wonder at uh, our skill of uh, of managing the total capacity. But the result was that we managed the total capacity uh, in such a way that we pleased most, we satisfied most of our customers. Well, we not only satisfied most of our customers, we pleased all of mm -hmm. our important customers, those mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. grew very fast. Mm -hmm. we, we satisfied most of them and we, we pleased all of the, the big growing ones. Yeah, I think um, in retrospect, yeah. you know, the, most of the people who looked at the foundry industry thought that technology was important, it is important, that capacity was important and that is important. But they really, they really missed um, what was really, uh, what, what ultimately made TSMC extraordinary. And, and I thought that it was um, uh, two things. Uh, your recognition in the, right from the beginning that the notion of a JV, the notion of uh, multiple fabs competing against each other was a detriment to growth. Yeah. That, that your, your strategy of using copy exactly to the best of your ability um, so that customers could ramp simultaneously in multiple fabs. You know, I, I don't know how many fabs we run at, at TSMC these days, but it's got to be many. Oh, right? yeah. Considering the size of our company yeah. today, in the course of the last 10 years, I think we've purchased um, uh, well over $6 billion in wafers and, and, uh, and growing as quickly as we have. You couldn't do that in one fab. And, you couldn't and the, do next, that in two the fabs. next six will come faster. Well, come faster. Lot faster. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. And maybe later I'll, I'll I'll tell everybody what what promise TSMC has made to me for my tenth billion dollar um, mm -hmm. purchase. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so so uh, the duplicate exactly was a was a wonderful strategy. The second thing, and probably even more powerful in the end, is uh, is this incredible focus on customer service. Yeah. And and I remembered when you called me. Uh, after your visit, I think it was after my visit, when I got back to the United States, you called me and, and, um, and you, said, you said, and it was a phrase that, that I remembered then and that I've heard I think several thousand times since, uh, since then, uh, was a phrase that you used, you said, uh, we will jump through hoops for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that, I, that I really admired about, um, uh, about, about that was uh, that it wasn't just what you told me that day. Uh, it was a phrase that, that, that drove through all of uh, TSMC. Uh, every employee uh, believed in it and uh, lived by it. And, uh, and people repeated it uh, year over year. How did you do that? How, how did that start and, and how were you able to drive that through the culture? 
that that is a uh, a culture uh, that uh, we we just started uh, with it. Well, actually, uh, let me tell you, I I was doing foundry work uh, even back in the late fifties at Texas Instruments, although we didn't call it foundry then. Uh, Texas Instruments uh, had uh, a transistor, not IC, transistor design from IBM. Uh, IBM had developed a transistor, had designed a transistor, developed a transistor, and uh, ran it on its pilot line, small pilot line. It didn't want to do the production, the volume production, so it gave it to TI to do the production. And I was in charge of one of those lines when I first joined Texas Instruments. And that was really very simply foundry work. And uh, later on, of course, we did more uh, IBM uh, foundry work, uh, foundry work for IBM. Uh, and of course, at TI, later on, we, we did a lot of commodity work, uh, commodity uh, production. And between the two, I enjoyed, between the foundry work, customer work, custom work, and uh, the commodity work, I enjoyed far better uh, the uh, foundry, the uh, custom work. So, so that was, uh, and, and I also knew what the, what the secret was, uh, what the, uh, the, the, the key was uh, to uh, custom work, successful custom work. That is satisfying the customer. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so jumping through hoops was something that I learned uh, in the late 50s uh, when, I, when, when I was at TI doing foundry work for IBM. Uh, uh, and uh, so how, how do we, so, so in TSMC, we actually tailored everything in the company, the organization, the uh, compensation system, the uh, evaluation system, we tailored everything to customer service, to jumping through hopes. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I, I told you uh, an anecdote uh, last night, uh, I was visited by a big IBM company, I mean, this was, uh, you know, more than 10 years ago, and he was very big, and uh, we were still uh, fairly small. We, we were a uh, couple of billion dollars, maybe, and he was um, a lot more than that. His sales was a, a, a several times that. And, uh, and he sort of um, was telling me, he, he and I had dinner together, and this CEO of uh, this big company, I mean, he, he sort of intimidated me by saying, well, maybe I will go into your business and compete with you. Um, so I let that go for the time being. But several minutes later, I asked him uh, innocently, uh, John, how do you evaluate, evaluate your fab manager? And uh, he, so he gave me the list. He, Whoa, he said, uh, yield, cycle time, productivity, uh, and uh, ability to make billings every month, you know. I mean, all those things, he told me. Uh, and after he ran through his list of uh, 10 or 12 uh, factors, he said, what else? He said, don't you evaluate your fab managers the same way? I said, no, 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 John. Uh, I evaluate them according to how much complaint I get from customers about their fab firm. And that's the honest truth. I, I really did that, have always done that. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the evaluation of, uh, of uh, the FAB managers. Uh, and, uh, and, now, I mean, and we don't even keep P&L in each FAB. Mm -hmm. We don't. Uh, and, well, uh, but uh, we, we do keep very good track of how satisfied, how satisfied the customers are. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and if, if uh, a fab manager has got a very unsatisfied customer, he is in big trouble. 
I don't care how much money he makes. Uh, he's in big trouble. Well, Morris, don't be surprised if the uh, the number of complaints uh, to your fab managers, you know, steps up dramatically after uh, after tomorrow. <laughs> 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 uh -huh. Especially the ones from me, anyhow. <laughs> so I, now that I got it all figured out, I'll dial in. <laughs> Uh, and so, so you know, certainly the the customer focus and the jumping through hoops for customer customers is, is a, a core part of your of culture, and it, it is it, it isn't just it isn't just a tagline for you. It is really a way of life, and I, I experience it every day. You know, the, as I as I think through think through um, uh, you know the, your creation of, of TSMC, you innovated at so many different levels. Uh, you you started a company that that um, has never existed before of its kind. Uh, it a very, very large investment uh, in Taiwan, uh, you know, by any standards then and now, and um, uh, and have, have built it into a into a global company. Um, but as you think back, uh, well, even even thinking about the culture of Asia, the notion of innovation as a core culture, um, building something that is a one of a kind and, and certainly the first of its kind, is very countercultural. How, how did you? How did? What was your experience in in, um, in going through that? Well, it was uh, not easy. Uh, I agree uh, that uh, the culture in Asia uh, is uh, usually uh, not um, just um, starting something new. I mean, I just give you an example. I mean, they 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 pride themselves on entrepreneurship. But uh, the entrepreneurship in Asia is usually driven by, not by um, a new idea, but by the desire of uh, uh, being your own boss. Uh, I mean, I'll give you a, a, a very um, uh, earthly um, example. I mean, I went to a barber shop in my neighborhood. And uh, there are only two barbers in that not barber shop. And one day, the junior barber told me that uh, he wasn't going to stand uh, this, uh, his boss anymore. Uh, he would go out and open a new shop. So he opened a new shop, three doors down, three doors <laughs> down on the, on the street. And uh, all right. and. Uh, so, so he took customers away from, uh, you know, like me, you know, I mean, uh, to, his, to, to, to his new shop. And both of them had to work very, very hard. Uh, both of them had to, they, they both discount, start to discount. Okay? The, the, the market is, 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 is still the same, the same size, you know. And, and, uh, and uh, it, it's not even, it's not a happy situation anymore. I mean, both of them are very bitter and very, <laughs> very resentful to each other. And, and uh, so I have stopped going to either one. You know. it's, 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 it's not a happy experience anymore. I mean, that, I mean that's, that is entrepreneurship, uh, Asian style. So how did you convince the venture capitalists and how did you convince the Taiwan government and how did you convince employees to... You know, I find that convincing employees to join a startup company is, in fact, harder than convincing a VC. Well, the, uh, uh, back then, of course, uh, the government, uh, they sort of trusted me. Of course, I did have uh, the credentials uh, of uh, my uh, U.S. Uh, experience. I was uh, uh, the head of uh, Texas Instruments Semiconductor Business. And uh, back then, uh, TI uh, had the biggest uh, semiconductor business in the world. So I was a credible uh, credential, I guess. Uh, and the government decided that uh, if they were going to uh, start, if, if they were going to fund a semiconductor company, uh, I, I seemed to be a, uh, a perfectly reasonable candidate to, uh, to, start, to, uh, to start this company for them. So that part was uh, pretty easy. Now it took some convincing to get Phillips to invest, but I did that too. Uh, after all, you know, uh, I I knew them uh, before uh, I went to Taiwan, and uh, they also knew uh, my track record. And uh, so, and they they listened to this uh, foundry pitch, 
and they thought they thought uh, that it was something uh, very innovative. Very innovative. They 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 weren't sure that it would work, but uh, they were willing to put in some money uh, just to let me try it out. You know, so so that part was uh, more difficult than the government's part, and then the rest of the uh, investors they were very difficult to to convince. Uh, in fact, I didn't really convince them. Uh, I maybe convinced two or three of them. The rest of them were coerced by the government to invest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, no, I, I had a team of uh, three ministers that helped me uh -huh. to get funding, to get investments from them. You know. uh, in fact, one of them was the premier himself. Uh, uh, so uh, I remember uh, that um, uh, the biggest investor who, who, who was allocated 5%. He was uh, uh, told to invest uh, 5%. And uh, he invited me to dinner three times. And each time I went with uh, an assistant of mine, two of us, and we were surrounded at the dinner table by 10 of his staff. And they grilled me. They grilled me and my uh, assistant on the details. They knew nothing about semiconductors. Nothing, nothing at all. Uh, but they, they grilled us on uh, financial issues, and they grilled us on, you know, general issues like uh, how, do, how do you think you're going to compete with, you're going to compete with uh, uh, American uh, companies, Japanese companies, uh, even Korea companies? They are way ahead of you. How do you compete with them? My answer to them was, no, we don't compete with them. We're in the foundry business. Those other companies are not in the foundry business. They may be, they may do some foundry work to just to fill their capacity, fill their fab, but uh, they they are not our competi uh, competitors. We are going to start a new business, and that of course um, made them uh, even uh, <laughs> even worry more, you know, even worry more. So anyway, those, those uh, but but I did make two friends, I think. Um, I didn't know them before I uh, made the pitch uh, for their investment, but after I made the pitch, uh, they told um, third parties that uh, that uh, I my presentation was the best they had ever heard about the investment. I made two friends, but uh, the rest of them uh, were coerced by uh, by the government. Uh, the premier told me that uh, the the biggest investor, five percent investor, wanted to back down to to two percent or three percent, and the premier had to call him and said, uh, "Gee, uh, Mr. So and So, uh, you know, it's government policy here that uh, we want you that we want to start the semiconductor company. Aren't you going to support government policy?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> So that was what happened. Was <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, when I was an entrepreneur, uh, I was I was 30 years old, and and I had a um, I had a well at, at the time PowerPoint didn't exist, so I used Persuasion, which was which was uh, on the on the Macintosh, and um, I, I don't think my my Persuasion was that good either. I don't th if it wasn't because of Wolf Corrigan who's sitting out in the audience making a few phone calls on my behalf, uh, I, I I I don't know what I would be doing right now. But um, uh, just how, how did you how did you tell the uh, the TSMC story? Did you have a did you have a pitch, or did you just hand them the brochure on the core values? Oh no. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that it wasn't convincing. I, I, just... I spoke eloquently <laughs> for at least ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a presentation. I did. You have did. A, it wasn't PowerPoint at that time. It was foils. Foils. <laughs> foils yeah. But I did have a foil presentation and. Uh, I, I rehearsed it myself, and I prepared it very carefully. And uh, as I said, I spoke eloquently for 30 minutes, <laughs> and true. I answered all the questions. Mm -hmm. And so, so um, you know, people say that it's it's uh, it's quite rare, and I think statistically it is quite rare that that founders um, that found the company end up building the company, run it operationally, uh, turn it into a multi-billion-dollar company, take it public, grow it even further than that. And um, and in your case, uh, even one step beyond that, having 
having groomed a successor and, and the, continue, the company continues to, to do fabulously. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you attribute how do you attribute to, uh, I guess, maybe answering the question in two different ways? Why, why do you think there's so few people who do that? And how do you attribute to your ability to do that? Well, I think most people who found companies really haven't had um, experience uh, running a big operation. Uh, I did, however. I, I was uh, an operating executive before I founded a company. I, in fact, I had uh, something like 30,000 employees uh, working under me at Texas Instruments. Uh, so I was a, uh, a, an operating executive before I founded a company. And uh, then, uh, of course, I founded a TSMC, and TSMC started with 150 employees. Uh, it, it took a long time. Uh, before the employees I had in TSMC equaled the employee, the number of employees I had at TI, you know. And I enjoyed the operating management work. Uh, so when I had the chance at TSMC to become a big operating executive again, I enjoyed it. Uh, but, I mean, a lot but of people, people usually, operating executives have a hard time thinking small. You know, operating executives have, they're wonderful at, at running a machine, optimizing a machine, tweaking it, getting a lot of yield out of it, getting a lot of return out of it. But well, they, they have a hard time thinking small. How did you get yourself to think small again? To I, think I, zero I, billion dollars I, I don't think I had to think very small. Uh, I don't, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess um, uh, right after we started TSMC, I hired... Um, uh, the president uh, of uh, TSMC. I was the chairman, and uh, so I hired the president, and he immediately hired uh, 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 the uh, U.S. sales manager. Uh, and uh, so it was, a, it was a, a fairly well-structured organization, even at the beginning. Uh, and then on the operational side, of course, we had this group that was spun off from uh, Itri, uh, as you already uh, mentioned, and uh, they were uh, they were very familiar with the with the details of the uh, manufacturing line. So uh, I I guess I really never had to um, worry about every little detail uh, on a production line. Mm -hmm. uh, now we started 150 people, uh, but uh, most of them were were pretty uh, key people, you know, mm -hmm. man managerial types. Uh. Now, running a very large operation versus building a company is 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 as you know now very very different. Yeah, yeah. You know, how would you how would you uh, how would you describe you know how you have evolved yourself uh, along the ways from from 1987 to now? Well, I I think that the mentally you have to adjust yourself to the changing uh, status of uh, the company. Um, for instance, um, when TSMC uh, first started, in the first few years, of course, the growth wasn't very, very high because uh, we, were, we were waiting for our customers to emerge. The customers were the fabulous company. So the first few companies we were taking um, business were getting business uh, from the big uh, IBMs. Uh, Intel, TI, Motorola were all our customers uh, back in the uh, first few years, and they were very important to us. They taught us uh, how to control quality and uh, a lot of things. Uh, they were very important to us. Uh, but they were not the they were not the customers that eventually turn out to be our most important customers. Our most important customers, the ones that were ultimately important, were still being born at that time, the first few years. And then uh, in the 90s, we, we went through a rapid expansion phase. The, the, almost the entire decade of the 90s, we were growing at uh, 
you know, I, I kept, I didn't keep track of the exact number, but it, it must have been uh, over 50% a year, average, uh, yeah. uh, all through the 90s. So you, you had a mental attitude for, for that kind of uh, growth. And then 2000, 2001, you know, the uh, internet uh, bubble uh, bursted, and uh, the semiconductor industry as a whole plunged uh, 30 percent in one year from 2000 to 2001. Did you lose money that year? Huh? Did you lose money that year, the TSMC? No, we did not lose money that year, but our growth slowed down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it, in fact, uh, our growth, uh, well, we, 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 we had negative growth uh, in 2001 also. We plunged 25 percent, I think, not the 30 percent of uh, the industry. But uh, since then, our growth has slowed down to um, average of uh, 15, 20 percent now, rather than the 50 percent. So you had to, I had to adjust my my attitude. You know, and if if you can adjust your 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 attitude to the different periods of uh, a uh, company's uh, life. Uh, a company usually goes through a, a successful company, usually goes through a rapid expansion and then a period of consolidation and then maturity. Say. If, if you can adjust yourself to these different um, periods of a uh, company's um, uh, 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 life cycle and also bring different skill, bring a different skill set to cope with each period, mm -hmm. then I think uh, you're a happy man. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, then you're a happy man. Uh, I think those, some people, some uh, very uh, uh, smart people, they, 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 are, they can only get used to very rapid growth. And as, as soon as uh, growth slows down, well, they, they, they will say, this is not my cup of tea anymore. I want to start something new. I want to start something from zero again, so I'll, I'll, I'll experience rapid growth again, you know. Uh, well, uh, I, I uh, maybe unfortunately am not that type of people. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with what I've got. I, I, I saw it growing very rapidly, and I saw it uh, uh, now maturing. Uh, but it's still good business, you know. Uh, I consider everything higher than the world average economic GDP growth as good business. The world average economic uh, GDP growth is uh, only about uh, 4%. Uh, uh, the U.S. is uh, less than 3% average. Uh, uh, well, Morris, as soon as I have what you have, I'm going to be happy with what I have. <laughs> <laughs> Did that come out right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, so, uh, mm. so part of certainly part of part of um, building TSMC, uh, you know, the, the the now bringing it to the current current era, uh, the uh, the the succession to uh, Rick Sai. Tell tell me about that. Tell me about the the process that you went through to um, uh, both groom uh, future CEOs and ultimately what were the characteristics that that you looked for to select ultimately Rick. Um, in that process? Well, the short answer to your question is that uh, you can groom somebody on um, uh, some of the skills that he needs uh, as a successful CEO, but... Uh, My uh, e-staff's in the audience, just so you know. Uh -huh. My staff is in the audience. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but the more <laughs> important ones, he really has to acquire himself. Uh, usually... Um, if you groom someone in, in, inside the company, you pick someone that has uh, executed well. Uh, uh, that's usually how a person, uh, a manager, gets promoted within an organization. He is usually a very successful executor. And Rick, Rick started out in the, in the ranks of running fabs, right? He was one of the fab yeah. managers. Yeah, I mean, he is an excellent executor. So, I mean, all right, so what did I do? I, uh, he, was, he was an operations man. He, he was basically a technical person, 
engineering type. Uh, and uh, when he came to TSMC, he was uh, a he, he was uh, at first a uh, uh, a deputy uh, fab manager, and then he became fab manager, and he became a group fab manager in charge of a group of fabs and so on. And then he became operation VP. Uh, and then at that point, I decided that uh, he would be uh, uh, a candidate for uh, for my uh, for my job. Um, so I put him in in in, mar in sales marketing. I mean, uh, and I also uh, put him in as the president of uh, a subsidiary of ours. Uh, uh, the subsidiary is uh, Vanguard, and it's it's also a foundry, and put him there. That's right. You had him run Vanguard for a while. Yeah, I had him run Vanguard yeah. for a couple of years. He was president of Vanguard, and then he came back to TSMC, and I uh, put him in as um, marketing and sales uh, uh, executive VP. Uh, so he had both he had both operations and the marketing and sales. Mm -hmm. Those were the two major functions uh, in TSMC anyway, operations mm -hmm. and marketing. And so and that was the sales. process that you went through to, 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 groom, to groom Rick um, to be CEO. Yeah. But you know, you're methodical in just about in everything I know that you do. And you break every problem down into its, its, uh, its, um, its uh, fundamental pieces. And, and, and so in the case of, of ultimately selecting Rick to be CEO, I know that it must have been extraordinarily thought, thoughtful. And um, you know this is a company that you've built, so it's also personal. And you know, how did you? What were the criteria that you ultimately went through to, uh, to select Rick? That you well, are ready for the job. The criteria, um, I think, uh, uh, first, first uh, of all, uh, his um, adherence uh, to the values. I, mean, I still come back to values. I mm -hmm. think those are the important, uh, very important. Uh, and uh, then um, his uh, skill set, um, and uh, because of uh, the exposure he already had uh, to the two major functions that we have, uh, operations and, uh, and the sales, uh, uh, I think he already acquired a very complete uh, skill set. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you look at uh, a person's uh, imagination uh, and uh, uh, really when you come right down to it, how smart he is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, uh, I, I certainly, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, I think, become successful uh, when they are not uh, uh, very smart, maybe, but uh, I don't believe in that. I, I, I wouldn't. I, I, and I think that uh, Rick is a very, very smart person. Yeah, well, yeah. I think that, that the selection yeah. of Rick has been fabulous, and, yeah. and he certainly lives by the core values of the company, yeah. he lives and breathes by it, and, yeah. and certainly intellectual capacity is extraordinary. Yeah. So now, now as you think, think going forward, you know, the um, TSMC is now uh, the largest foundry in the world is the second second most valuable semiconductor company in the world. As you look forward for Rick, what are the challenges that you think are ahead of him? Oh, just just enormous, uh, I think. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, you know, just uh, this thing. Good time uh, to pass it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can't stand still. Yeah. You can't stand still. Uh, I think this business. Um, it's still like uh, a uh, a treadmill that speeds up all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, if you if you can't uh, keep up, you, f you you fall off the the treadmill. Mm -hmm. It's a treadmill that speeds up all the time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, you you will fall off the treadmill if you if you don't keep up, if you can't keep up. Um, so uh, and that's Moore's law, also by the mm -hmm. way. Um, uh, Moore's law is uh, is is just a relentless taskmaster. Um, um. Well, one of the challenges that Rick and I both have, and this is this is um, and, and applies to all of the semiconductor companies in the world today. You know, Moore's law is um, 
is a enabling force, but is also a depreciating force. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, on the one hand, it um, its advancement uh, makes possible amazing new devices and new technologies, but on the other hand, because of its compression and its uh, integration, it makes makes uh, valuable products uh, cheaper and cheaper every day. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think very there are few forces in the world that are that are of this nature, and few industries of this nature. That's true. Yeah. How do you think this plays out? Well, that's why you have to keep up on the speeding treadmill. Uh, if you fall off, you have become depreciated. <laughs> <laughs> well, seriously, uh, it's seriously, true. you know, it's true. Uh, uh, people uh, who have lived with Moore's Law for a long time uh, uh, usually have mixed feelings about it, just, just as you said. Yeah. Uh, they have mixed feelings mainly because uh, Moore's Law is a relentless uh, taskmaster. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the best people, um, and the best people change from time to time. The best people are able to, to uh, live with it and use it uh, uh, to advantage. Uh, yeah, sure, the chips become cheaper and cheaper and so on, but uh, still, we intend to make money. Mm -hmm. I mean, no matter how cheap the chips get. Uh, and you intend to make money too. God, uh, I hope so. Yeah, so uh, 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 we, it's, it's, uh, it's part of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. I think that, that um, so, so <coughs> I'd like to invite all of you guys to be part of our conversation. You know, everything that, that Morris has spoken about so far is, is uh, profound and thoughtful. Um, you know, why don't you guys also um, join us in the conversation? What can, what can Morris answer for you guys? And if you could just introduce yourself, that'd be great. Hi, Nathan. The world when they said they were going to get out of the process development uh, aspect of the job of the of the of the industry and work with TSMC on new advanced technologies. As somebody who has a long time in TI as well as a long time in TSMC, what do you think this means for the U.S. semiconductor industry when TI, who is really one of the, the great powers in the, in the industry, uh, no longer feels like they can keep up uh, by themselves? Well, I really think that uh, the U.S. should not worry too much about um, uh, wafer fabs being uh, in other countries. Um, um, it's a it's a globalized uh, world now, and uh, assembly, for instance, uh, have long moved uh, offshore. Wafer fabs, of course, are not quite the same as assembly. There's uh, more technology, and there's also defense technology involved. So I'm completely uh, in favor of uh, keeping enough wafer fabs in the United States to uh, at least satisfy uh, our defensive requirements. Uh, but uh, as far as the commercial requirements are concerned, I wouldn't worry too much about uh, the wafer fabs moving I, offshore. I wasn't speaking so much about the production capacity mm -hmm. as I was the innovation aspects of it. You know, we always pride ourselves here in the U.S. as being very innovative, and yet TI is saying, hey, we can't keep up with the innovation anymore. Yeah, but uh, still have uh, Intel. Intel, uh, yeah. <laughs> And Intel, Intel is, uh, I think, doing a pretty smart thing. Uh, Intel is going to set up a, a fab in China also. And uh, I think that uh, they are not just going to use the, the Chinese fab as uh, a production uh, vehicle. They are also going to use the talents in China uh, to, uh, 
further advance their innovations here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Good evening, Mike Brizzoni with Camp Marketing. First, two questions. The first is, as process saturates, are we gonna see Samson and Intel in the foundry business? The second question is, how is TSMC going to take your ADRs and move those net margins from the depository receipts closer to the company's historic margins? I'm sorry, my hearing wasn't very good. Did you hear the first that? question? Did you hear the first question? No, has, I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question was, let, let me see if I could paraphrase it. Uh, you know, as as the semiconductor technology, you said saturates. I, I feel that that. You mean, you mean as it gets more and more dense? I don't know that it right, stops. Right, exactly. Saturation at infinity. When, when Intel you, owns the majority of the produ production volume, are they going to enter the foundry business? Uh-huh. So his question is basically as, as, um, as technology advances and maybe Intel has more capacity than they need for the three or four or 500 million PCs a year that they build uh, or CPUs that they build, uh, would they would they use the excess capacity to go into the foundry business? And the same question applies to Samsung. And it, I think I think his question is your perspective on Intel and Samsung going into the foundry business. It's a completely different corporate culture. Foundry requires a completely different culture. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, uh, I, I was t telling the anecdote about uh, my conversation with this uh, IBM uh, CEO. And uh, Jensen didn't let me finish my anecdote. He interrupted me. <laughs> anyway, See how he remembers these anyway, things? I mean, we, 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 he, he told me that he valued his, his plant managers by uh, such parameters, such conventional parameters as cycle time, yield cost, and so on. And I said that we evaluate our plant managers by the satisfaction, by customer satisfaction. That shows how different the corporate culture is. This, yeah. And uh, actually, what I didn't finish when Jensen interrupted, interrupted it was that, was I decided right then and there that this guy is not going to be an effective competitor with me, even if he enters the foundry business. Uh, and I give you the same comment when you bring up Samsung and uh, Intel. I have a great deal of respect for them in what they are doing. But uh, I do not think that they will effectively compete with me in the foundry business, even if they have excess capacity. You know, as you look at it from the customer's perspective, and, and, and certainly I've, I've uh, you know, we've, we've purchased a lot and worked a lot with, uh, with TSMC over the years, you know, from our perspective, there's a very, very uh, important difference between a semiconductor company of force versus a semiconductor company of agility and force. And I think agility is something that, that is um, tough to teach, teach um, large corporations, especially when their business model is really about, you know, large, large common types of products, you know, with, uh, built with great force. Their field and effects are set. So it's, it's just a different business, different culture, different business model. Different culture, and, and, and keep in mind, I, I emphasize the, the customer service, the customer satisfaction aspect of the foundry business. But it's more than that. Uh, to give you another example, uh, the ability for us to deal with um, uh, almost uh, 50 different customers in the same fab in the same fab. That is an ability that um, no other semiconductor company has. Uh, and we, we, have, we, we just learned it uh, you know, over 20 years. Uh, that, that's, our, uh, that's one of our uh, trade secrets too, if you will. Uh, I'll simplify the second question, but it still deals with that small fortune of uh, depository receipts. How are they going to be used, and can TSMC grow four times in the next 15 years? How can we grow t four times in the next 15 years? We probably won't grow four times in the next 15 years. It takes, uh, let's see, um, it takes 15%, um, I think, 
to grow four times in 15 years, doesn't it? A little better, I think. 10% to grow four times in the next, uh, oh, that we can do. 10% <laughs> we can do. Yeah. Thank you. I was going to yeah. say more, mm -hmm. speak for yourself. <laughs> I, I, peg, I peg our growth rate, uh, at least my objective growth rate, is uh, somewhere between 10 15 percent, average compounded annual, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fabulous. It's, uh, but that's, that's something else. Yeah. That is something else. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Bob Liu. I work for a company named LAM Research, which is a supplier for TSMC. TMC is a big customer for us. We do quite a few hundred million dollars. I know LAM Research very yeah. well. So my question is, um, how do you leverage uh, your supplier's capability in terms of delivering we, capacity we, and innovation to your customers we and other them, values? We treat them as partners, too. Our, our philosophy is partners upstream and downstream. Part, uh, customers are partners, and uh, suppliers are our partners also, until they prove otherwise. <laughs> we, are, we are very lag, lucky. We are still one of your major customers in equipment. We were, we were kicked out by one of our major customers before Intel, right? <laughs> that, that's not a secret. So we are still doing very well. My, my second question, also last question, is what kind of criteria do you use to evaluate your supplier to decide, hey, which one you want to go with? Well, uh, I don't think we really have a formal mechanism of evaluating our um, suppliers. Uh, you know, it's, it's just uh, we, we treat them as partners until they prove otherwise, uh, as I said. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any uh, formal evaluation mechanism. Just as we don't evaluate our customers either. I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's something you don't need to start. And so, <laughs> so, so Morris, mm. Morris uh, looking back 20 years now, mm. 20 years now, uh, $60 billion of value ago, um, it, now, that, now that TSMC is, is um, uh, you know, such a great company, you, you, most people probably don't even remember anymore, but was there a time in TSMC's history that you thought the viability of the company was going to be threatened? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, just uh, for instance, in 97, uh, our uh, president and uh, our CFO both left. Which by itself was already, you know, two key people leaving uh, in one year, I think uh, was already uh, bad enough, but uh, they both went to our competition, you know. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I think uh, uh, to us uh, that was uh, a crisis year. Uh, and, and we knew that uh, uh, the competitors uh, objective was to uh, try to uh, take uh, our uh, mainly American business uh, uh, from us. So uh, for, for at least uh, six months, uh, I, I was uh, you know, following our ex-president's uh, footsteps. When, he, when we knew that he had visited a customer to try to take business away, from us to uh, uh, for 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 the new company that he he, he joined, uh, I followed his footsteps uh, to try to neutralize uh, his effect. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, '98 came, uh, and uh, we were quite happy that uh, we we kept uh, almost 100 percent of our business. I would say 100% of our business, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, both of them, both the uh, the president and the CFO, 
very quickly left their new company also. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly TSMC is in the yeah. business that you're in. It's a people business. Oh, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, so that must have been a great threat. Yeah. Well, lucky for you, they didn't return my phone calls either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, um. and <laughs> for, for a moment there, when you said 1997, I thought, I thought the event that, tr that, that caused you to question your viability was when you met me. So I'm glad, I'm glad to. <laughs> you were a great help. <laughs> you were a great help in that year, 97, because, yeah. Now, when, uh, you, when you look back on the history of TSMC, what are some of the events that, that um, gave you just great pride that you felt? They are not, not just the achievement, but the character of the company gave you great pride. And, you know, as company builders, we look back, and, and it's not just the products, but, but it's you know, I, certain events. I, I do want to single out one event. Uh, that was the earthquake in uh, Taiwan. Mm -hmm. It happened in 99, and uh, it shut us down completely because we lost power. Mm -hmm. All our facts. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah lost remember. power. And in fact, uh, did, did you know that the NASDAQ uh, 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 index actually dropped? Um, well, not just not because of us alone, but uh, because, you know, Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Taiwan was a very key uh, factor mm -hmm. in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the PC supply chain and uh, electronic supply chain in general. And uh, because of the earthquake, uh, a lot of companies were shut down, and uh, we were shut down. And uh, so uh, NASDAQ uh, dropped um, for a few days until uh, we picked ourselves up uh, and uh, recovered. Uh, I remember the night the, the earthquake happened uh, at about uh, 2 o'clock in the morning of uh, September 21st, 1999. 2 o'clock in the morning, I was, I, was, I was jolted awake by the earthquake. And it was really very serious. I thought it was the end of the world, frankly. I mean, it, was, it, was, it shook so much. I mean, I, I lived on, on the uh, 12th floor. Uh, and it, the building shook so much that uh, I really thought it was the end of the world, uh, the end of me anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, then, uh, then it uh, subsided, uh, and I was glad I was still alive, although most of the, uh, the TV sets had, uh, had tumbled to the floor, and uh, the, a lot of the, uh, the, sh the, uh, the, the bookshelves and so on had fallen to the floor, and the, the whole apartment uh, was, 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 was like uh, a, a war zone, you know. Uh, but but I, I got a call from, uh, I got two calls, actually. One from uh, FC, who was uh, the president uh, at that time, and the other uh, from uh, Rick Tsai, uh, who was, I think, the operational executive EP. And they, they first asked me how I was, whether I was okay. I lived alone at that time. This was before uh, I got married. And I said I was okay. So the so next thing they said, they said, well, I'm going to, to the FAB to see how things are. And, uh, well, they were not the only, only people because it was 2 o'clock in the morning, remember. By about 4 o'clock, the parking lot was full. Hmm. All the engineers, hmm. the managers, manufacturing managers, they all came back uh, to, the, to the fab to see what the damage was. Hmm. And uh, so immediately we started to, um, uh, uh, to uh, recover. Uh, but uh, for two days we didn't have any power. And then on the third day, on day three, power came back. And uh, we, I think we started our operations again on day four. And uh, by day 10, we were already up to the same productivity uh, as uh, we had before the earthquake. So that was a very rapid recovery. Yeah, that and, was. Uh, and it, it also, um, just, uh, just uh, I, I was uh, really uh, moved to mm -hmm. tears. By by the um, 
the uh, spirit of the uh, the employees, the managers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, that's a great was, story. I I, yeah. uh, I remember it on on our mm -hmm. side, and um, uh, we were we were all on pins and needles because. You know, all of us, yeah. we have our business yeah. to run, and mm -hmm. we, you know, at the time, NVIDIA was yeah. rather small, and we had our quarter to make, and and um, and and yet, you guys, uh, you really, really didn't, really didn't miss a beat. No, we didn't miss uh, very much at all. We we maybe missed, uh, we maybe we were uh, uh, at the end uh, five or six days late, you know, mm -hmm. net, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, that was all. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That's really terrific. Yeah. Well, does anybody else have, I have one last question, and what I wanted to do was uh, s give you guys an opportunity to ask, ask a couple more if you, if you have it, and then I'd like to ask uh, one last question of uh, Morris. Okay, go ahead. Why don't you walk up and take the last one. Hey, Dr. Chen, uh, I'm Mike Chen. Um, so... Uh, correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong, but then I remember you published your autobiography back in 1998, and I have read it many times, and it was a great inspiration to me. And just wondering, now you have passed the torch to Dr. Rick Sai. When is the second bio, uh, When is the second part coming out? Well, I, I can't promise you uh, any date, you know, but uh, I do plan to write it, but I don't know when. Uh, I haven't got around to doing it yet. Mm. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, hopefully, hopefully, this book is going to be about your body of work, which, which I think is uh, is absolutely extraordinary, and and uh, it's it's a great privilege to uh, to uh, for all of us to have a conversation with you again tonight, Morris. As a as a last question, um, you know, there there's so many things you could you could hope for. Uh, but what what do you um, hope and aspire for TSMC long into the future? What are your hopes and aspirations? Oh, I just uh, certainly hope that uh, it will keep its values. That uh, that's uh, important, very important, uh, most important. Uh, but then uh, uh, I also hope that uh, it uh, continues to grow you know, at a rate that's between 10 and 15 percent <laughs> for, for the next 15 years, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I have every confidence that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, every, Morris, it, it was a fabulous having a conversation with you, as always. And, um, you know, a lot of people see the, see the, uh, the serious side of, of you. Um, and uh, and I've I've had the privilege over the years to to know what a great sense of humor you have, um, and uh, and um, uh, how much you enjoy uh, young people and, and and learning about their ideas. And so, just with, with one, one parting thought, I'm going to make fun of Morris. And this is a, I don't think he's ever I don't think he's ever heard this story, and I don't think Sophie you've heard this story before. So the first time Morris came over to our house, and um, and we're there having dinner. Uh, and I had just made some barbecue, and we're, we're sitting at the at the kitchen table, if you remember, and um, uh, and you were you were you were um, telling wonderful stories of um, uh, of your life to the kids, and um, uh, and you were funny, and you were you were uh, <laughs> you were you were um, really patient, and you you were telling your stories, and and at some point you asked the kids, you started asking the kids questions, and 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 Spencer was telling you something, and. You were, you were asking him, uh, I forget exactly what the question was, but he was explaining it to you. And, uh, uh, and you, were, you were cutting your steak, and you, you stopped cutting for a moment. And, and Spencer said, I think Mr. Chang fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Morris, I don't, I don't know if you remember this or not. You said, um, I'm listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> what, is I, um, I, yeah, what did I say? You said, I am listening to you. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyways, yeah. anyways, you guys, uh, you know, I, I, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you guys also got to see the, uh, the, the funny side of Morris that, that um, really endears him to me. And, and um, 
I want to congratulate you on your, on your uh, uh, recognition last night. Uh, it is a reflection of the contribution you've made to the world and certainly to our industry. Uh, without the work that you've done and TSMC have done, uh, the rest of us wouldn't be here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me say, let, let me say Jensen. Jensen and Morris, let me, let me, uh, thank you both. It's, it's very special when you can think about history. It's even more special when you see friends talking to us about history. Thank you so much. We have a small token of appreciation for you both. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. 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 Please, please take the time to fill out the questionnaire. We, we really would appreciate that. And uh, Jensen and Morris, I'm sure, will be around for a few more minutes to, uh, to answer any of the questions you may have for them. Thank you very much. See you soon. <laughs>